So Steven Seagal hosted SNL back in 91. And I have avoided this topic for so long because much like the man himself, I just can't seem to get away from it. He's like human glitter. If you use this stuff one time, you're going to find it stuck to your person for the rest of your life. Are you guys imagining if Steven Seagal used glitter right now? Look, I'm dead serious. I don't think he would ever be able to get it out of all of his crevasses. And yeah, I mean crevasses because at this point in his life, the word crevice just doesn't do those little hot pockets any justice. I know, I'm sorry. We're not here to imagine Magic Mike with Steven Seagal. We're here to talk about the worst host of all time. So let's go see why they almost fired the first host in the show's history because this is Red Eye Reviews. Okay, firstly, let's talk about the stuff that didn't make the episode because it it could have been so much worse. I watched this interview with Al Franken on the Your Mom's House podcast, who, by the way, is a huge fan of Seagal. Worst host by lapped every bad host. This is somebody that you've been there. You did, you did 15 seasons. 15 seasons. And lapped people lapped. as the worst. And is just the most awful person. Okay. <laughs> now. And he said Seagal walked into the writer's room literally turned down every single sketch that even had the tiniest bit of fun at his expense. Then he stands up and goes, okay, I have an idea. What if a lady goes to see a psychiatrist? And naturally I'll play the psychiatrist. What if she's there because she's been sexually assaulted in the past and she's having a hard time with it? Which... Already, I can't imagine a single person in the SNL writer's room going, huh, go on. No, yeah, it's starting to start to sound pretty, pretty promising. And I'm her psychiatrist and I hypnotize her. I have sex with her. <laughs> and then at the end, I tell her she's got to come back every week. <laughs> so, Dude, that's a great sketch. <laughs> yes, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what the, uh, right? What is happening? I'm sure the writers all looked around and they were like, well, uh, I, I don't I don't think so. Yeah. What, what do we think, everybody? No, no. I'm getting a lot of people shaking their heads. Got Dana Carvey really shaking his head, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's part bobblehead. So you kind of can't trust those movements. Needless to say, we didn't do that piece. Yeah. But he always was just an awful in so many ways. And Scott's an idiot. In addition to everything else. He did, however, write a sketch that made it into the show, and he insisted it had to be in the show. It's the final sketch, so I'm going to save it for near the end. But the show starts with Hans and Franz, which is my dad's all-time favorite bit with Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon. You know, many people have accused us of being involved with steroids. Yeah, they are right. And basically, if you haven't seen it, their whole shtick is that they just love Arnold Schwarzenegger and they love getting pumped up. Bob, you are. And all of it was them making fun of Steven. So your buttocks are like marshmallows. You're lucky we don't have a campfire here. So I went up to him. I said, Steven, are you OK? And he just didn't look at me. He's looking straight forward. He goes, quote, and I, this is a quote. I just wish Arnold was here so I could kick his fucking ass. Right. Doesn't mean you're weaker than Arnold. These guys just worship Arnold. So we rewrote it. Yeah. Seagal was so insecure about himself, he made them add lines to claim that he was stronger than Arnold. There's only one person stronger than Arnold, and that's Steven Seagal. <laughs> but but so, it doesn't work. I know. Once the girly man left, they did save the bit, but... It's just a hint at what they had to deal with all week. Welcome. We're back. And we just want to palm. You are. And now we cut to the host monologue. And there have been some fantastic ones like Eddie Murphy, Chris Rock, Chris Farley when he hosted. And then all the way at the bottom is this one. I think David Spade sums it up pretty well. 
he wouldn't do kung fu fighting as a uh, cold open oh my or God. a monologue. We had it something funny, then he throws in little kicks, you know? Uh, it would have been amazing. It was amazing. It just amazing. Because, so he says he'll do it, but he just talks it. It's still kind of funny, but he won't, he won't play at all. He turns kung fu fighting into spoken word poetry. He Captain Kirked kung fu fighting. She packed my bags last night, pre-flight. Brings me back again to find I'm not the man they think I am back home. But before that, he starts his monologue with some very subtle gloating. Above the law, hard to kill, mark for death. My newest film, Out for Justice, which is number one in the nation right now. I'm pausing so you could applaud me. No, 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 stop, stop. Not to mention the man rocks back and forth worse than I did trying to pay attention in high school math. But he grabs a guitar. Chris Rock and Tim Meadows somehow got roped into singing backup for him. And then he just proceeds to tell us what the lyrics to the song are. Everybody was Kung Fu Fight. Well, it was a funky China man. Funky China town. They were going with expert timing. The backup singers immediately stop because they have no idea how to help out at this point. We'll be right back. Ugh, it, it's sheer magic. And we just got started. So let's jump to his first skit where he plays a cop named Nico in Brooklyn. I know, it's, it's a real stretch for him to play. Improper searches beating suspects. I caught these two guys with three kilos of cocaine. What do you think they were doing with a making chalk for girls softball games? What do you think they were doing with making chalk for girls <gasps> softball games? He's just got a real talent in delivery. It's amazing. I will give him credit. He gets one genuine laugh. However, it's Chris Farley doing the thing that only Chris Farley can do. A little less action than you're used to, huh, Nico? Yeah. <laughs> he then hangs out with Rob Schneider, who, don't get mad at me, but I just don't think he's talented enough to make this scene funny at all. Tonelli Tola, the guy who breaks the rules. Detective Tonelli making copies. Do me a favor. Shut up, all right? This is what I'm thinking. He then proceeds to hang him out a window for seemingly no point. And then the skit just kind of ends. I don't want you to talk to me no more. You got it? Honestly, that applaud now sign that the audience has is probably working overtime because they wouldn't know that this was supposed to be over. Okay, his next bit is going on the dark side with Nat X. It's the only show on TV written by a brother. Produced by a brother and strictly for a brother. The man is so black, he was counted four times at the Million Man March. The man is so black, he sweats oil. If you've never seen The Dark Side with Nat X, I'm not... They they wrote these jokes. Don't get mad at me. You're not gonna get it! You're not gonna get it! That's what you want to see! That's what you want to see! The man that invented the game of pool. A game that isn't won until the white cue ball knocks all the colored balls off the table. But it's Chris Rock, okay? It's a talk show about black media. It's obviously hilarious because it's Chris Rock. But he interviews Seagal, who's dressed up as Andrew Dice Clay, the Dice Man. And if you don't know, he was a controversial comedian with a Brooklyn accent, okay? It shouldn't be hard for Seagal to portray this. And yet, every single potentially funny line, he either stumbles over the words, and I kick any butt that you could say that didn't make that kind of money. Or his timing is so bad that it bombs way worse than most of his movies. So are you going to go see a movie? <laughs> hey, I ain't see you any movies and what's the afro anyway? And at this point, the whole audience is confused as hell. They've had the funny sucked out of them for 45 minutes, leaving them all depressed, I'm sure. And then he goes, introducing Michael Bolton. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Bolton. And then Bolton gets up and proceeds to do his best to make the audience not regret how they're spending their weekend. About a 
pass out with all the effort he's putting in. And then after this, we do actually get a few funny skits. But if you can guess why they were funny, well, it's because a certain somebody was not in those skits. However, he sure as hell makes up for it because he gives us the most awkward 10 minutes of Chris Farley's whole career. So, uh, you're graduating this year. Am I? I think Dougie here needs a soda. Chris Farley plays a dude who's going to pick his date up for a night out and Seagal plays that girl's tough, scary dad. It should be... A home run. The writers thought there's no way in hell Chris Farley can't make this funny. And yet, Seagal is like, hold my frickin' one-inch ponytail. Bet you I can make it so it's not funny. Well, that's good because I guess that means in the middle of the night I won't get a phone call that your car broke down and that's why you were late or anything like that, will I? Uh, no. Well, I'm glad she did because I guess that means that uh, I won't be getting a phone call from you that you lost track of time or anything like that, will I? Do you think anyone's ever walked out of an SNL filming before? Like, I I know these tickets are free, but I would probably ask for my money back. I have something that I'd kind of like to show you that has great significance to me. It's a tattoo. Yeah. Rob Schneider walks through here just to remind us that he's still on the cast. Oh, whoa, cool. Cool car. (laughs) And the best part is when he says a line that he thinks is funny. Okay, he he acts like he nailed it. I guess it wouldn't matter if I did because uh, I wouldn't be there at the time. I'd be here waiting. Yes, yes, sir. Look at his face. (laughs) Look at that. That's the look of a man who thinks he is crushing it right now. Oh, man, I'm so famous. This is so good for my career. Well, I guess I'll see you later. Well, I, uh, I guess I will be waiting here. There you go. There you go, put an emphasis on words that don't actually mean what you think they mean. Is this a good time to mention that during the week of rehearsal, Seagal repeatedly told cast members that not only had he never seen Saturday Night Live before, but that he didn't know what any of these people did. Yeah, he's like, uh, Dana, Dana who? Carvey? Mike Myers? Uh, Chris Rock? Chris Farley? The, okay, hold on, there's multiple Chris's? Adam Sandler, who the... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, get, I'm getting nothing, I'm getting nothing. Yeah, and it doesn't actually make me feel better, but it does... It just kind of confused me a lot more. However, there you go. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Bolton. And now, Michael Bolton. Okay, this is it. This is it. This is the sketch written by Seagal that he said absolutely must be in the episode or he would walk. Which, I mean, it's probably a deal SNL maybe should have taken a bit more seriously. But he plays a green peace photographer who has it out for ExxonMobil. The first phase of the spill will take place off the Monterey Peninsula, spilling nearly 7 billion gallons of sweet crude into the breeding grounds of the California gray otter. We get just a board meeting. There's no jokes. <laughs> There's literally no jokes. It's just a board meeting talking about profits. Mr. Bradbury, it's President Bush on the phone. I know you're busy. I just want to tell you I'm at your disposal. And if most of these guys don't look familiar, it's because they're not cast members. They're just random stuntmen that they had hired because Steve Seagal asked for it. So he walks in. He tries his best to read his own lines off the teleprompter. And perhaps the most interesting, a picture of you listening to the President of the United States on speakerphone as he reveals his part. I've got evidence. Photographic evidence. And he just can't do it. These are lines that he wrote for the sketch that he demanded be put in the show, and he still couldn't do it. Just come on. Yeah, come on. What's the... Hey, wimp. But after they push him around for, according to the sketch, a whole day, he finally snaps. 
This is what happens when you pollute the planet. And you might think he had more lines and old Red Eye just kind of edited those out. Nope, I didn't. He throws these people around a room and then he shouts about pollution. And because the whole thing was so terrible, they had to put the words the end on the screen just so that we knew it was over. But we end with the entire room realizing they were just a part of history in the worst way imaginable. But that is it. The worst SNL episode of all time. The episode they never aired again, and that's why my copy is absolutely trash. I did grab a few bits, so let's head on over to Red Eye Reacts. Arnold could easily rip Steven Seagal's skinny little arms off. He could use them as dental floss. That's right, unwax. <laughs> Fist against poop-filled diaper. <laughs> yeah. That, that your mother is, is beautiful in her own way. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've got evidence. Photographic evidence. <laughs> huh? Thank you so much for watching. As always, a huge shout-out to all these patrons. You guys are awesome. I apologize for putting you through that. Please don't abandon me. We've been voting on some great movies. Some of the ones you've seen recently, they actually picked. So if you want to be able to do that or make me watch more garbage like this, you can support me through the link in the description. There's also a link down there to a Discord community and my merch store. But I will see you next time. And until then, stay happy and stay healthy. What do you think they were doing with a making shark for girls softball games? 